Uh, good evening, everyone. Myself, Shruti Rajshikran from Christ University, Bangalore. Uh, today's presentation is entitled as Designing MNNI I mean Functionalized Metal Organic Framework Towards Energy and Environmental Application. Basically, metal organic frameworks are a class of moiety which are obtained by the combination of metal iron plus ligand in order to form a 3D frameworks. Morphs can be of three types. It can be micro, meso, and macro porous morphs. The main advantages of morph is that the pore size can be tuned and the surface area can be modified, which is helpful in the construction of the 3D framework. So basically, the morphs are obtained by um, commonly used linker for the synthesis of morphs are aromatic carboxylic acid. Some of the examples of aromatic carboxylic acids are benzene dicarboxylic acid and benzene tricarboxylic acid. So the main challenges faced in the field of metal organic frameworks was the synthesis of bimetal are rare and it's not yet reported. And we took this as a challenge and synthesized bimetallic organic framework. Coming to the synthesis of um, uh, amine functionalized metal organic framework, uh, first the pre metal precursors were mixed with the ligand, heated at 120 degrees Celsius to form a bimetallic framework. Later on, the co-ligand aminoterephthalic acid was incorporated into the bimetallic framework, heated at 150 degrees Celsius to form a uh, amine functionalized framework. Later, this uh, amine functionalized framework was used for the energy storage application studies like supercapacitance studies. These are some of the image which we obtained from the single crystal studies. So the characterization which we, uh, the synthesized MOS was then characterized for various characterization techniques. And from the XRD pattern, we could see that only the change in the intensity which confirmed that the crystal structure is not disturbed even after the incorporation of the co-ligand into the bimetallic organic framework after functionalization. From the FTI, we can analyze the functional groups and some are present in our material. The band at 486 and 606 confirms the presence of metal oxide, whereas the band at 1640 ascribes to C double bond O. The presence of fluorine anion is confirmed from the band of 1356 CH and OH band at 1672 and 1347 respectively. So with this, we could get some information and we moved on to the further characterizations like uh, electron microscopic studies, BET analysis. From the BET analysis, we could uh, analyze that our uh, material exhibited type 2 isotherm with a surface area of 110.9 meters square per gram with a pore volume of 0 0.704 cc per gram. Uh, so with that, we could uh, see that the amine functionalization has helped in the increase of the surface area. From the SEM, we could uh, image, we could see that our material is highly porous and crystalline in nature. From the EDS analysis, we could interpret that the elements, what we have expected uh, has been incorporated into our material. Later on with the TEM, we could see that the crystalline nature of our material. Then to get more in-depth on our, uh, to get more knowledge on the oxidation state and the electronic configuration, XPS analysis was done. For each element, we could obtain the similar binding energy reported in the literature. So for manganese, we could get a binding energy of 641, 652. Similarly for nickel, it's a respective binding energy, nitrogen at 398.4. Uh, carbon, uh, the various bonding, C double bond C at 284, C single bond O at 285, and OC double bond O at 287.9 electron volt for oxygen. Similar, uh, finally, the survey spectrum. So the application which we have choose is the supercapacitance application, which is further used for the is a, uh, energy, is also used as an energy storage material. So from the cyclic voltammetry study, we could analyze a proper oxidation and reduction curves, which confirms a synergistic effect between the manganese and nickel. From the DCD measurements, we could calculate the specific capacitance, which was found to be 711 farad per gram for amine functionalized MOF, which is high when compared with 
bimetal and monometal morphs. From the impedance studies, we could find the charge transfer resistance where for the amine functionalized framework, it was low. Uh, we could say that it is conductive uh, when compared to the other morphs. We conducted stability test up to 5000 cycle and we observed that material was stable up to 3000 cycle with 89 percentage retention. So coming to the conclusion, uh, we have successfully synthesized uh, manganese nickel bimetallic framework with uh, incorporation of amine functional group through solvothermal technique and uh, it was subjected to supercapacitive application and exhibited. 711.60 farad per gram capacitance at one ampere per gram uh, current density so it also exhibited a high energy and power density of uh, 33.5 and 305.25 uh, which where this material can also be used for the fabrication of asymmetric supercapacitor and uh, the reason for using amine functionalization is that it helps in the increase the surface area of the material that helped in the uh, high efficiency energy storage material for the different uh, more applications like uh, um, even this material can be used for different applications. So these were some of the reference I have used. Thank you. Thank you, Shruti. The session is now open for discussion. Questions from the audience. I encourage the audience to ask more questions. I think there are no questions. So I thank Shruti Rajeshagaran for your excellent work. Thank you, ma'am. And presentation. So we shall move on to uh, next speaker, uh, Ruk Sheikh Rukzana Begum. Yes, ma'am. So we will uh, share the presentation from our side. You just say when you need to move the slides. Like next. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Can you see the slides? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Okay. So you may start now. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, respected meeting members, good evening to all. Myself, Kuksana Begum. Uh, uh, I'm doing research in uh, Velur Institute of Technology in Velur. So I'm doing research under the guidance of Dr. Arun Kumar Chandra Shekhar, sir. My research area is to power electronic devices and uh, storing charges devices by using triboelectric nano generator. Today, my topic is on uh, power management circuit for triboelectric nano generator as a self-powered uh, movement detector. Uh, 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 please next slide, ma'am. Uh, these all are contents uh, about my top my topic: uh, nano generators, triboelectric nano generators, modes and materials introduction and device fabrication and working mechanism and electrical analysis and results and real-time analysis and conclusion. Next slide, please. Uh, so before going to start about uh, triboelectric nano generator, first I am discuss about uh, nano generators. What is nano generators? It converts uh, scavenging mechanical energy into useful electrical energy. There are several types of nano generators based on their applications. They are uh, piezoelectric nano generator, pyroelectric nano generator, triboelectric nano generator, and electromagnetic uh, induction. In these all nano generators, uh, triboelectric is the most of this. Uh, next one. Uh, so, what is triboelectric nano generator? So, we are going to do any kind of load or maybe pressure or maybe friction, uh, and then we are going to generate the electricity from that. So, basically, triboelectric nano generator is an energy harvesting device. It converts the external mechanical energy into electrical energy by the conjunction of triboelectric effect and electrostatic induction. So, this new type of nano generator was firstly developed by Zhang Ling Wang in the year of 2012. So it is a small variable and can operate anytime, anywhere, regardless of weather conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
there are uh, four modes are available to generate the electricity through this triboelectric nano generators by using uh, these materials we can design a uh, tank device so it depending upon the triboelectrification so basically it has been divided two parts here uh, pass, one is called positive ion neg uh, another one is called negative ion so uh, these are uh, here four modes are available first one is uh, contact and separation mode and second one sliding modes third one uh, single electrode mode and fourth one free standing mode it depends uh, uh, it depending upon our uh, uh, device which uh, which device we want it depend it depends on application which device we want so next slide please so uh, how uh, after uh, design a tank device how to connect that device to power management circuit to the functional devices and entering the era of internet of things variable implantable electronic devices are in rapid development leading to an urgent demand of clear sustainable and distributed power supply so batteries have tra traditionally been used to power these devices but their low capacity and large volume cannot fully meet the rapidly increasing demand so one of the most effective ways for solving for battery problems is to harvest energy from the surrounding environments or uh, from human movements so harvesting irregular ambient energy from daily activities such as running walking jumping and using it to, to power mobile electronic devices uh, iot devices or health monitors is becoming a reality with the development of nano generators so to solve some energy and uh, environmental problems by replacing these batteries with the self powered electronic devices and generating sustainable power but here one problem is occurring that is a triboelectric nano generator use a high voltage and high impedance low current output it generates due to the low operating voltage and impedance of electronic devices which cannot tally the high voltage and impedance of triboelectric nano generator directly so Uh, it's not possible to directly use triboelectric nano generator as a power source for the electronic devices so as a result triboelectric nano generator needs an efficient and proper power management circuit to supply power to electronic and uh, charge devices next slide please so this is the fabrication process of the c tank device here figure a shows uh, step by step of the ecoflex polymer sheet making process and figure b shows a realistic digital representation of the c tank system with its uh, upper vision and its uh, dimension and figure c shows fabrication device this device is excellent tensile durability and low weight also next slide this uh i did in theoretical format uh first uh, after that uh, i will uh, i i did in practical format also so this is the circuit for charging in multi sim simulation what i did figure a shows uh, bridge rectifier with the uh, capacitors in multi uh, uh, capacitors and figure b shows here rectifier output waveform and figure c shows rectifier with the capacitor output waveforms next slide please Uh, i got here uh, electrical output performance of this c-tank device here figure a and b shows voltage and current uh, of c-tank device using ecoflex as contact material with slow medium fast movements figure c shows uh, here rectification current of device with the slow medium fast movement and here figure d shows uh, the charging and discharging voltage curve on the 0.01 microfarad and 0.1 microfarad capacitor charger next slide ma'am coming to real time analysis uh, this c tank device designed in integrated nothing but inbuilt charging unit that can be easily implanted for real time ap application so uh, here biomechanical power collecting various pressing movements including slow medium fast tapping are applied to the device with a variable pressure and when performing a task such as running walking jumping pressing this can be used through energy harvesting so next slide please and this uh, uh, this heat tank device uh, it is a hygienic safe suitable materials for uh, variable and portable applications were used next slide please and the first advantage is to develop a power management circuit that is flexible uh, degradable and nano structured 
this uh, device was created to provide continuous power to low power variable devices both mechanical and biological energy harvested by it so it can be used as a self powered movement sensor or self powered charging device it can also used as a variable power source with an inbuilt capacitor charging circuit during a range of human motion next slide so here uh, these all are the sustainable development goals here 17 goals are there in this uh, it always encourages us to conserve and enhance our resources by gradually changing the manners in which we develop and use technologies here in this uh, 17 goals seventh one is a uh, offered affordable and uh, clean energy and nothing but whatever we are creating is low price and clean energy for nano structure next slide Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Please, if you have any queries, please. Thank you, Rishana. So this is now so open for discussion. So, what form of how we use for this uh, tribal generators? What sort of polymer how we use for this device? Ecoflex polymer, Ecoflex, ma'am. Ecoflex. Okay, uh, is there any particular motive you choose that particular polymer or? Uh, Actually, uh, number um, number of materials are there, but I am uh, I choose uh, this Ecoflex. It it generates more uh, voltage, ma'am. Can you please comment on the stability of this uh, polymer while using for this uh, tribal generator? Stability, ma'am. Yes. Ah, oh, yeah. Stability also. Uh, uh, it gives more stability, ma'am. Actually, I didn't put that waveform, uh, stability waveform, but it gives more stability. For ten days, twenty days, uh, can use that. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? So I think there are no questions. So thank you, Rishana Shaya, for your presentation. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. So we shall move to the next speaker. So next one is uh, S I L one one six Shandanu Ghosh from I A T Delhi. Shandanu, are you there? Shandanu Ghosh. I think he has not joined. So moving on to the next one. S I L one one seven, Anjani M Sebastian, Anjani M are you there? Yes, I am there. So can I present now? Yes, please share your presentation. Okay. 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 Uh, is it visible? Yeah, visible. Please put out to the full screen more. Okay. Now is it yeah. visible? Yeah, it's perfect. Perfect. Please continue. So can I start now? Yes, 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 please. Uh, so good, e good, good evening, everyone. So uh, myself, Anthony M. Sebastian, and I'm coming from National Institute of Technology, Tiruchirappalli, and I'm representing the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. So first of all. let me introduce my conference topic its influence of strain rate and temperature on the tensile behavior of ti al intermetallic it's basically a molecular dynamic simulation study so let's go on at first the introduction so the first thing first thing that comes about is like why we have used intermetallic gamma ti al ti al intermetallic why it is being used one of the main reason is that in For aircraft and automotive components, intermetallic gamma TIAL was considered one of the best substitutes. 
and there are some properties for the intermetallic gamma TIA, which actually substantiates these reasons. The first thing is this high thermal stability, excellent oxidation resistance and structural stability during long term exposures, because, you know, for aircraft components for modern aircraft jet, jet, jet engines uh, during the uh, during its motion, it encounters high thermal stresses. And during that, high thermal stability is required. And at that moment, excellent oxidation resistance and structural stability gives added advantage. And then it's low mass. It's low mass improves acceleration and fuel efficiency. And also, it lowers the carbon dioxide emissions in vehicles. So what is the objective of this entire research which I'm working on? It's like to perform the molecular dynamic simulations of uniaxial tensile loading on gamma TIAL intermetallic in the 100 direction for different values of strain rates and temperatures. And all of these simulations are done on a software called as LAMPS. And then to visualize what is the structural change happening? What is the dislocation progression? What types of dislocations are there? What is the deformation behavior and how dislocations react to it? To visualize all of these structural changes, we use the, we use the help of a software called as OVITO. So now let me discuss what the simulation methodology which I've adopted. One of the most important thing which we have to take care of is the potential file we have used. It's the potential file uh, actually helps to, to distinguish how the atoms in that particular system, if for example, in, the, in, this, in our case, it's TI and aluminum atoms, how they interact. So if, if it goes according to the first principles data and all the values are matching, then our potential file is an app file. So a potential file which are, the potential file which I have used is a 2NN MEM potential file, second nearest neighbor intratomic potential modified embedded atom method. And it was directed by Kim and his fellow scientist. And the time step which I have used for simulation is one femto seconds. And the boundary conditions are all periodic boundary conditions in all the three directions. And the thermostat which I have used is NPT nose Hoover thermostat. So the parameters are uh, for the initial simulation box. As you can see, I have, I have shown here the initial simulation box of this whole simulation, which I've done. It's the structure is tetragonal L10 unit cell. And the total number of atoms, as you can see, aluminum atoms are colored in red and titanium atoms are colored in blue. This whole structure will consist of 15,984 atoms. And the edge lattice parameters, lat lattice parameter values are 2.824 Armstrong, 2.84 Armstrong in X and Y directions and 4.065 Armstrong in the Z direction. And the fractional coordinates is actually used to uh, actually actually is there to describe the tetragonal L L10 unit cell structure. And you can see the simulation box. The final simulation box which I have designed is like 141.2 Armstrong, 282.4 Armstrong and 203.25 Armstrong dimensions respectively. As you can see from the figure one initial simulation box. So what is the objective? The objective I've told you earlier, it's like the MD simulations are carried out at temperatures at of 300 Kelvin, 500 Kelvin, 700 Kelvin and 1000 Kelvin at a constant stranded value of 5 into 10 raised to 9 per second. And thus, by using this, we can understand the influence of temperature and constant strain rate on the on the whole tensile deformation behavior. And the strain rates were also varied at constant temperature of 300 Kelvin. And then we can understand that how the strain rate is actually dependent on the tensile deformation behavior. And then this whole atomic structure was visualized, as I earlier told before, by using an Orbito software. And one of its functionalities is its dislocation measurements or dislocation progression. And that was also visualized using a dislocation extraction algorithm. So this is the sim uh, animation of the simulation which I have done. And this was like for tensile deformation at a strain rate of 5 into 10 raised to 9 per second and a temperature of 300 Kelvin. And I have actually shared some screenshots of the whole of, of the whole deformation process for some particular uh, strain strain values for E is equal to 0 0.025, 0 0.035, 0 0.065. And you have to note that at this 0 0.065, the peak stress value was being observed or it was the value at which the ultimate tensile strength was observed and at E is equal to 0.1. You can see that in the x x direction, one the the dimensions are actually increasing during tensile deformation behavior. 146.82, uh, 
to 151, 155.97 to 161.1. You can see that the dimensions in the x directions are increasing. And similarly, like while loading in the 100 direction, it, it is obvious that there will be changes in the dimensions in the y and z directions, which you can observe from these snapshots. So what are the results? Because this is the one of the main important part things. The first thing is that what is the influence of strain rate on the peak stress values? You can see from the curves, it's like the black curve is having the black curve is having a the tens a back to black curve is shown here and the brown the brown curve and the violet curve is shown here. You can see that the plastic region has increased along with the peak stress value. The peak stress value has also increased with increase in strain rate values. So the peak stress value increase with increase in strain rate while performing these molecular and dynamic simulations. And then this is the tabular representation of the uh, peak stress values and at what particular corresponding state of strain the peak stress value was observed. You can see that with increase in strain rate, the peak stress value has actually increased from 3.36 gigapascal to 4.06 gigapascal. And the strain rate has also increased abruptly from 0.062 to 0.0975. And from this, you can observe that the plastic region has increased along with the increase in peak stress, which shows that at increase in strain rates, high values of ductility can, can be observed. And now uh, with the increase in temperature, you can see from the curves that I've shown a 300 Kelvin curve, 500 Kelvin, 700 Kelvin and 1000 Kelvin curves. From these four curves, you can understand that the plastic region or ductility has improved, but along with that, the peak stress value has decreased. The peak stress value has decreased and also the value of the strain at which the peak stress value is observed has also increased. So the ductility has uh, improved with the temperature, but along with that, the peak stress value has decreased. So that was the observation which you can make from the difference in temperature values. That's the influence of temperature and influence of strain rate for you. And this is the tabular representation of it. The peak stress was observed to be 3.73 gigapascal or 300 Kelvin, and it decreased to 1000 uh, to 1.96 gigapascal at 1000 Kelvin. And you can also see that the strain values have also increased the strain values at which the peak stress values are observed have also increased along with it. And this is for a 100 tensile loading. And now uh, this is the dislocation progression, which you can observe. And you can, uh, from this dislocation progression, you can see that a large amount of dislocations are observed. And then this is the snapshots. This is the Ovito snapshots, which are observed, uh, like for this earlier deformation, which I have shown here. This is a simulation animation of the dislocation progression. And now this is the uh, dislo the, in the snapshots of the dislocations progression, which I have shown earlier. And you can see I have done, I've take the snap, took the snapshot at different strain values, 0 0.025, 0 0.03, 0 0.065, and 0 0.1. You can see that the dislocation number gradually increased from 0 0.025 value to 0 0.03 strain value, but it has abruptly increased from 0 0.065 value to 0 0.01 value. So you can this this is basically the dislocation mechanism that's what we can observe in this you can observe that dislocation intersection happens and this leads to dislocation kings or jocks and pinning of dislocation happens as you can observe there and because of the spinning of dislocations dislocation tangle has happened and what happens is that if dislocation tangle or, or, uh, dislocation tangle happens with a dis, uh, the dislocation movement must be like um, it will be difficult for dislocations to move which means work hardening that is the reason why we can see or uh, we can see improved strength, improved peak stress values for gamma TIL intermetallic thing. And you can also observe the green dislocation lines. Those are the Shockley partial dislocation lines. The Shockley partial dislocation line, what they have, what they do is that they can only slip along surface and cannot climb. And when encountering obstacles, they bunch together into perfect dislocations, they cross slip and they expand to partial dislocation to slip and then leads to stacking falls. So what happens if stacking fall defects come? Uh, stacking, if stacking fault defects come, it means that work hardening has happened. So this might have that the cross slip, slip becomes difficult due to high stacking fault width leading, leading to work hardening. And uh, this is this observation which I've made. At, it, with, with increase in temperature, you can observe that the dislocation length has decreased, uh, length has decreased and dislocation density, which is the ratio of the dislocation line length to the volume of the simulation box has also decreased considerably.
from 18.6 in a 10 raised to 17 per meter square to 5.5 in a 10 raised to 17 per meter square. So what dislocation density are actually the measure of the dislocation number value. And if dislocation density increases, this means that they act as effective, the number of dislocation value has increased and they act as effective obstacles for dislocation motion. So as dislocation density increases, you can dislocation density decreases, you can tell that the work hardening nature decreases. That's why uh, in the first initial curve of the of different temperature rates, I've shown you that the peak stress value has decreased. It's because of this decrease in dislocation density value, which leads to which leads to this uh, this portion. So this is like the description of that uh, case, like uh, dislocations are effective obstacles for dislocation motion and they result in strengthening and the maximum dislocation density volume value is found to be 18.6 and that's why we observed a highest peak stress value at 300 Kelvin. And it was observed that with increasing temperature, the value of dislocation de de decreases from 18.6 to 5.5 in the 10 raised to 17 per meter square. So what are the conclusions that we can take? The first conclusion is that the value of peak stress, it decreased from 3.73 gigapascal to 1.96 gigapascal when temperature was increased from 300 Kelvin to 1000 Kelvin. And this is mainly because of the decrease in total dislocation density value, which I have shown earlier from 18.6 to 5.5 and raised to 17 per 10 raised to 17 per meter square. And then the peak stress value increased from 3.36 gigapascal to 4.06 gigapascal with the increase in, uh, increase in the value of the applied strain rate from 1 in 10 raised to 9 per second to 7.5 in 10 raised to 9 per second. And the dislocation number was found to be dependent on the applied strain rate as I have shown here that the dislocation number value uh, it varies according to the, uh, the strain strain values and what is the mechanism of de deformation I have also discussed and that's what we have found in this whole research that I have done. These are the references. Thank you. Thank you Anthony for your presentation. So now the session is open for discussion. Uh, Anthony, I have a small question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma so uh, how would the orientation of these grains will affect this de uh, de deformation or uh, peak stress and strain? Uh, the, f the first thing is that like, uh, uh, as I have so this is the dislocation progression for a particular simulation at 300 kilowatt, 500 and raised 9 per second. The orientation that I have done is the normal 100 orientation and that's what the orientation along which the stress was applied. So uh, for any for any orientations at like this particular strain rate, this will be the, the dislocation progression and this will be the deformation mechanism itself. Tangling of dislocation, dislocation pile up and then the observe, observe, we observe partial, dislo shockly partial dislocations too. So that's why, like, uh, if in the orientation of grain, uh, grains, like for this particular study, it's like one zero zero orientation, the normal orientation, and that's how we observe this certain dislocation progression. And it it will also vary according to the grain orientations, but that that we have not dealt with in the study. This is just like a simplified case where like a one zero zero orientation, and along which the stress is applied, and then they study the deformation behavior of it. Thank you, Anthony. Any any other questions from the audience? I think there are no more questions. So once again, thank you Anthony, for your presentation. Thank you. So we shall move on to the next speaker. Next one is uh, SIL118, Swati PV. Swati, are you there? Swati? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, can you please share your presentation? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Anthony, can you please mute? Yes. Is this screen visible, ma'am? I'm Swadi PV, working in the Department of Physics, Central University of Tamil Nadu, under the guidance of Dr. Veema Dhirima. The title of my presentation is Self Assembly of Micro and Nano Size Liquid Drops. First, let us see what is self-assembly. It is the spontaneous association and organization of numerous individual entities into coherent and well-defined structures without external intervention. Molecular self-assembly involves diffusion, which is followed by the association of molecules through non-covalent interactions such as hydrogen bonding, 
ionic bonding, hydrophobic interactions, and Van der Waals interactions. Now, in this slide, we can see the broad classification of self-assembly. It is classified on the basis of the nature of the building blocks by the system where it occurs and by the nature of its process. Now, what is breath figures? Breath figures are formed when water vapor condenses on a cold surface in presence of humidity. Breath figures are commonly observed phenomena in daily life, like the formation of dew, the fog that appears on a window when we breathe on it. The breath figure technique can be used for the fabrication of porous polymer films. The porous polymer films are generated by the condensation and evaporation of water droplets on a polymer film during its solidification. The honeycomb film formed by breath figure method using star polystyrene polymer as building units was first reported by Francois in 1994. There is a need for large scale, highly ordered porous polymer films of micro and nano scale due to their variety of applications such as self cleaning templates, sensors, membranes, etc. And the study which is performed in our lab produced micro pores which ranged in size from 3 micrometer to 20 micrometer. Nano sized pores with controllable morphology were generated by researchers using solutions of metal nanoparticles and polymers, which produced hierarchic porous films containing micrometer sized pores and nanoscale pores among the nanoparticles. Now, going into the breath figure formation steps first is the casting of the substrate with the polymer solution, then, the substrate is, present, is placed in a chamber with humid air. As a result, uh, the solvent evaporates, and as a result of the evaporative cooling of the solvent, water vapor condenses onto the surface. As time passes, the droplets grow in size, and finally, we get an array of pores after the complete evaporation of the solvent. The schematic representation of the process is shown on the right side of this slide. There are various parameters which affect the breath figure formation. First, polymers, various kinds of polymers such as homopolymers, amphiphilic polymers, block polymers have been used to prepare breath figure films and the molecular weight of the polymer is found to have an influence on the shape of the pores. Higher the molecular weight, we get larger pores, airflow, airflow velocity has been found to affect the breath figure pore size and shape. Normally, with higher airflow speed, smaller pores were formed. Relative humidity. In water vapor, high humidity is beneficial for the formation of ordered breath figure films. No ordered pores can be generated when the relative humidity of the environment is too low. But the threshold value actually depends on the properties of the solvent, of the polymer, and any other additives which we use. Solvent. Volatile solvents such as chloroform, carbon disulfide, toluene is used to provide evaporative cooling of the substrate. Substrate, porous films can be prepared on hydrophilic substrates like glass, metals and other inorganic substrates which are not eroded by solvents. Atmosphere, the atmosphere is also found to influence the breath figure formation. Breath figures were formed in at atmospheres of alcohols and binary alcohol, binary mixtures of alcohols. Now, the experimental details. We use polystyrene of three molecular weights, 35,000, 1,92,000, 2,80,000 gram per mole. The solvent used was chloroform and we used 5-8% polymer in the solvent. The substrate used were the smooth and root DVD surfaces. We use drop casting and spin coating technique for the casting. The images were obtained using confocal microscopy. These are the images which we observe, uh, which we obtained uh, using confocal microscopy on while drop casting and spin coating on the smooth and root DVD surfaces. Here uh, we can see that there is an evident uh, change in the patterns observed during spin coating and drop casting that is uh, for 35k during uh, spin coating we on root surfaces we don't see any actual pores there these black dots are the pores which we see here 
while on smooth and crude surfaces during broadcasting we get pores that are well ordered and also we can see some hierarchical patterns are seen uh, on spin coating on crude surfaces for 192k that is uh, also hierarchical structures were obtained on crude surface of the dvd using polydimethyl siloxin previously in our lab which means that uh, the thickness of the film along with the underlying constraints of the surface influences the pattern formation. Uh, the thickness of the film during spin coating depends on the viscosity of the polymer solution and the speed of the rotation. Here we have used 1000 rpm as the speed of rotation such that the thickness of the film mainly depends on the viscosity of the solution. The viscosity of the polymer solution is related to molecular weight by the semi empirical Markowing relation as given below which means that for 35k molecular weight keeping all these parameters such as speed of rotation and uh, weight percentage constant the thickness of the film is not favorable for the formation of pores on grooved surfaces while the other for other molecular weights the thickness facilitates random uh, pore formation on grooved surfaces these are the references Thank you. Thank you, Swati, for your presentation. This is the session is now open for discussion. I think there are no questions. Thank you, Swadi, for your presentation. So Thank you, ma'am. We shall move on to the speaker, SIL 110, Antony Chidi Ezika. Anthony Chidi Ezika, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Can you please share your presentation now? You can present. All right, ma'am. All right, ma'am. All right, can you, is the screen visible now? Yes, yes. Please stop. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm here to present uh, mzine PPY nanocomposite as an electrode material for high capacity sodium ion battery, investigated from uh, first principle calculation. So the outline of the presentation is as follows. It will follow, I will start with uh, the introduction, followed by the research goal, the methodology, the results and discussion, then finalize with conclusion. All right, so uh, a little background on the, the materials. First, polypyrrole. So what do we know about polypyrrole? Polypyrrole is one of the most uh, research organic uh, semiconductor. Uh, it has a very high electrical conductivity. Uh, the properties of polypyrrole ranges from uh, being a promising candidate for electric uh, energy storage application to uh, electronic uh, uh, applications. So what do we know about uh, MZ? MZs are two-dimensional, uh, they, they are two-dimensional materials that are highly dedicated for energy storage. Uh, their electrochemical performance is largely influenced by their structural configuration, uh, surface chemistry, morphology, and the composition. Uh, uh, well, the potential of the uh, MZ is generally uh, for energy storage, which includes supercapacitors and uh, ion, uh, metal ion rechargeable batteries. 
Now, uh, a common uh, a class of uh, nanocomposites that has received a uh, great uh, attention in the recent years is uh, the matzine and the uh, polypyro nanocomposite. So they are actually organic polymeric nanocomposite with uh, redox active sites that make them a good potential electrode. Uh, they have uh, they exhibit reversible redox reaction. And the uh, enzyme assists in that, in, in inhibiting the redox, uh, the irreversible redox reaction of PPI. So application again is they are mostly used for batteries and uh, portable and wearable electronics. And uh, sodium ion batteries, what are they? They are actually rechargeable metal. Ion batteries. Uh, sodium, in terms of the cost, is cheaper than the, the lithium ion phosphate cathode, according to the research done by Peters and, and colleagues. Uh, sodium ion batteries have received a lot of uh, attention when, and they have comparable redox potential. Uh, the standard hydrogen electrode uh, basis for the potential is a uh, uh, 2.71%, which is uh, comparable to that of lithium ion batteries. Uh, but what's the major challenge with sodium ion batteries is that sodium have a high higher ionic radius compared to lithium ion. So when we look at that, the intercalation of a sodium ion within the graphite anode, which is the commercially available anode, the graphite, is kind of uh, problematic. So there is need for us to look for uh, a good way to, to circumvent this challenge. As a result, we, we have uh, the, the nanocomposite, which we have proposed and investigated. Uh, because uh, the investigation is based on uh, first principle, we'll be employing uh, DFT to run the calculation. Uh, for us to investigate, for us to look for a favorable site of absorption on the material, we'll be using Monte Carlo, the classical Monte Carlo uh, calculation. And this, uh, because we are using Material Studio, this is one of the module, and the module is an absorption locator, which employs a uh, assembles to to look for the best configuration site so before we proceed uh, in terms of describing the absorption properties of uh, the sodium ion in the nanocomposite uh, first of if we look at the first image we have the polypyrrole this is a dimer of polypyrrole and uh, this is the magazine that we are using as the substrate to first find the preferable absorption of the polypyrrole, followed by the sodium ion. So sodium ion, as a, as a matter of fact, four absorption sites. In between the bonding is the bridge. So it can absorb at that point or uh, absorb at the hollow all we have to identify tops here we have that of the uh, we have that of the uh, hydrogen then we have that of the carbon so if it can we are looking for the best favorable position for the sodium to absorb so based on that what is what is the research goal the research goal First, we want to study the molecular interaction of uh, the, the polymer that is polypyrrole on maxine using DFT and uh, Monte Carlo. Then we obtain an insight into the intercalation mechanism of the sodium within the uh, nanocomposite and uh, also investigate the electronic behavior. Then we analyze the results of the interaction and the electronic properties then we we'll suggest and give the conclusion on the suitability of the nanocomposite for sodium electrode application. 
Now, the methodology adopted is as follows. The computational procedure, first, we constructed the uh, PPY using the polymer builder, then the magazine structure was done using the crystal builder. And the largest parameter obtained for the magazine is uh, 9.21 Armstrong uh, at the zigzag and uh, along the along the A and the B direction and the angle is 120 degrees. Then after that, we proceed to uh, geometry optimization and uh, equilibration in order to relax the system. So we did that using a uh, uh, cast step module uh, in Material Studio. Then followed by adsorption of PPY to magazine. And this was done using 1,000 steps uh, 1,000 steps in the 10 eating cycles with uh, 50,000 steps per cycle. So then the uh, the energy window and the maximum absorption uh, set for the absorption is a uh, 100 kilocal and uh, 10 Armstrong uh, distance. Then after this Monte Carlo, we went back to DFT to now investigate the electronic property. So the electronic property was done using the plane wave, which can be found in uh, uh, the cast step. We also employ uh, GGA functional, that is general gradient approximation functional in, 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 in addition to the uh, PBE scheme. Then we, after that, we finalize the process by analyzing the results. So, so to, to analyze the results, we did a few calculations and we discovered that the absorption uh, site for the sodium ion is at the bridge site and uh, the absorption distance uh, with respect to the surface of the magazine and the PPY is a uh, uh, 2.95 Armstrong and uh, 2.6 uh, respectively. So the absorption was actually exothermic, which gave uh, which is minus 0 0.44 electron volts. This is uh, like a quarter of the absorption that was recorded for the absorption of uh, polypyrrole on the magazine, which stood at minus uh, 1.6 electron volt. The charge transfer was actually done using an uh, electron density difference. And based on that, we could see the map of the electron density. Uh, the, the blue shows the uh, charge accumulation and the, the yellow shows uh, charge dis uh, depletion. So based on this, we can see that there's no accumulation or depletion on the ion, uh, which shows that there's no uh, charge transfer. Then investigating the electronic uh, properties, we did the uh, density of state, then the uh, partial, the projected density of state. Now, at the Fermi level, we discover that the energy is quite low, which translates that uh, the material, as a, uh, the system as a, as a whole, uh, can transfer electron, which is suitable for electrochemical uh, reaction. And we can see from the projected uh, density of states, the, the orbitals that are contributing, we could see that of the S, uh, P, and D states. In conclusion, uh, this research investigated uh, the did an atomistic uh, investigation of the absorption of uh, sodium, the intercalation of sodium into a magazine, PPY, and the composite. As such, we saw that uh, the sodium interacts fairly strongly with the uh, magazine and the composite. Uh, according to the charge difference analysis, we saw, we, we saw that the Dominant absorption mechanism is a uh, physisorption. Uh, then uh, the 
PDOS, that is uh, the projected density of state, suggests that the sodium magazine nanocomposite possess a metallic property that is, is, is conductive. And uh, the strong interaction and electronic properties supports the use of uh, sodium uh, magnesium, uh, sodium magazine polypyrrole nanocomposite for energy storage and uh, electronic application. As such, uh, we will recommend that further studies should be done in terms of uh, investigating the, the capacity of uh, this, uh, the sodium uh, storage and the further investigation on the charge transfer using another method such as uh, the Mulliken and the non-covalent direction studies. Thank you. Uh, this is the selected references for the work. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, my supervisors, that is Professor Sadiku E.R., uh, Professor Suprakas Shinare Ray, uh, Professor Amam, and Professor Bonex. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, NRF for the uh, grant uh, and TWAS. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anthony, for your presentation. Now the session is open for discussion. Anthony, I would like to ask a small question. So right, instead ma. of uh, polypyrrole, if you have chosen any other conducting polymer like uh, polyaniline, what would have been the interaction between the mixing? What would have been the interaction? So, sorry, I didn't, I didn't get the question well. So uh, I am just asking, like, uh, if you have chosen any other polymer instead of polypyrrole, then what would have been the interaction between the mixing and that particular polymer? So uh, would you get a better interaction or a poor one when compared to polypyrrole? So what's your comments? Yes, actually, that calls for a uh, very good uh, research. I'm also thinking from, from the interaction of polypyrrole with uh, magazine, we uh, discovered that the interlayer spacing, which is actually good for the intercalation of uh, uh, sodium ion that has a higher uh, ionic radius, we observed that polypyrrole played the role of increasing the uh, the inter interlayer spacing from the XPS uh, studies that we did. So when we bring in other uh, uh, conductive polymers, uh, we also would love to investigate that effect. If that is achievable, then uh, polyaniline or poly, uh, P dots, PSS, uh, other organic uh, uh, conductive uh, materials, if they can successfully increase the interlayer spacing, then it will be very good for energy storage. Thank you, Anthony. Thank All you right, for a nice presentation. Thank you, ma'am. So we have come to the end of uh, this session on energy. And now we are moving on to the next session. Uh, this is a short innovative lecture on electronics application. So, so the presenter is uh, Jashashri Panda from the Department of Material Science. Jashashri Panda, are you there? I think she has not joined the conference. So we shall move on to the next one. So next session is on uh, polymer nanostructures. So the first presenter is Alina and Matthew. Alina, are you there? Yeah, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Can you please share your slides? OK. Is it visible? Hello? I think it is loading. 
Uh, yeah, it's now. Okay. Please start. Okay. Good evening. I am Alina Matthew, research scholar at Department of Physics and Electronics, Rice DMTV University, Bangalore. I present on the topic effect of functionalization on the optical properties of polymer based nanostructure. So it includes uh, introduction, objectives, result, and discussion, conclusion, and references. Polymer based constituents with the prominent and peculiar characteristics are demanded extensively. The incorporation of functionalized polymer nanomaterials exhibit fascinating properties and multifunction applications. Polymer nanoparticles have attracted interest nowadays due to its small size and high surface to volume ratio uh, and uh, due to its optical, electrical, mechanical and biological properties, it can be applied in biomedical engineering, bi packaging, automotive, electronics applications, etc. So uh, fluorescent polymer nano polymer nanoparticles can be uh, fluorescent fluorescent or non fluorescent intrinsically different modifications of polymer nanoparticles helps them to improve their fluorescence fluorescent polymer nanoparticles can be used in optoelectronics drug delivery sensing bioimaging etc so my objectives are to synthesize functionalized polymer nanoparticles via hydrothermal treatment and to analyze the structural and optical properties of developed polymer nanomaterials so i used Polyvinyl alcohol as the precursor. PVA is a semi-crystalline polymer. It is, it is having adhesive property, water-soluble polymer, non-toxic and biocompatible. So uh, I prepared uh, 10 mg per ml uh, concentration and PVA dissolved in DA water and stirred it and added uh, nitric acid for uh, nitrogen doping and did the, uh, did the hydrothermal treatment, uh, brown color trans, uh, brown colored uh, powder obtained and it dissolved in DMF. So result and discussions. First I did uh, UV analysis. The UV visible absorption spectra of synthesized nanomaterials were plotted in the range of 250 to 650 nanometer. For pure PVA, there is no absorption uh, in the UV region and it has very low absorbance. The modified PVA nanostructures saw, uh, showed prominent peaks uh, at maximum absorption wavelength of 290 nanometer and 280 nanometer uh, corresponding to uh, 80 microliter uh, and 60 microliter respectively. Uh, Dopants respectively. So the, 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 the maximum of both amps correspond to the pi to pi transition of carbon. Uh, and you are in which the degree it shows green color. So, uh, the energy necessary to excite an electron from the balance band of the conductor conduction band is known as the optical energy band gap. The optical band, uh, band gap represent, uh, represent uh, it depends on the physical and photochemical properties of the material. By talk plot method, band gap of the synthesis materials were calculated. The direct band gap for 80 microliter and 60 microliter dopants were obtained as 3.43 electron volt and 3.58 electron volt. In the extrapolation of the talk plots observed, uh, the band gap of the synthesis material decreased with the increased dopant concentration. So, uh, photoluminous analysis, the, the spectra provides the optical properties of the material at different excitation, excited electronic states. The spectra disclose the connection between the excitation wavelength relative to, relative to its emission wavelength. Due to the absorption of uh, emission centers, non-conjugated polymers like polyvinyl alcohol are intrinsically non-fluorescent. PL emission of synthesized polymer nanomaterials in DMF has been carried out for the excitation in the range of 300 to 7, 700 nanometer. Uh, the excitation dependent PL was observed, which denotes the presence of various morphologies of polymer nanomaterials. So uh, I have done antibacterial studies of these uh, synthesized nanomaterials. The antibacterial response of the prepared sample was tested against gram-negative E. coli DH-alpha, pseudomonas fluorescence and E. coli bacteria and gram-positive gram bacillus subtilis and staphylococcus aureus bacteria. Uh, well uh, by well diffusion method, uh, uh, the uh, so uh, uh, by double division method, uh, the antibacterial studies were uh, observed, and uh, there, there was no zone of inhibition. 
So non-antibacterial activity of confirmed by well diffusion method. So concluding uh, the one port, a hydrothermal synthesis of thermally stable non-fluorescent PVA provides green fluorescent polymer nanomaterials. Prominent absorption peaks were observed in the UV region and absorption in increased with the decreased open concentration. These amorphous polymer nanomaterials have direct band gap and show more semiconductor behavior corresponding to its increasing dopant level, dopant concentration. Excitation dependent luminescent nanomaterials have no zone of inhibition against uh, selective gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Hence, these non biocidal functionalized polymer nanomaterials possess enhanced optical properties and can be applied in bioimaging and optoelectronic applications. So, these are the refer uh, some selective re references I have used. Thank you. Thank you, Alila. The session is now open for questions. Any questions from the audience? I think there are no questions. So thank you, Alina, for your presentation. We shall move on to the next speaker. So the next thank speaker you, is uh, SIL 121, Rishma B. Philip. Rishma, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Can you please share your presentation? OK, ma'am. Ma'am? Yeah, it's perfect. Please start. Okay. Then good evening to one and all. I myself is Krishma B. Philip, uh, and then I'm from the Department of Chemistry. Today I'm here with the topic photoluminescent nano sensor based on MPA modified manganese top zinc sulfide quantum dots for the selective detection of glucose. Actually, we are making a sensor uh, from uh, these quantum dots. These all are the topics that we are dealing today. Introduction, materials and methods, results and discussion and conclusion. First, moving to the introduction, quantum dots. As we all know, quantum dots are zero dimensional nanoparticles with particle size around the range of 1 to 10 nanometer. Uh, they have three dimensional quantum confinement, and due to their smaller size, they have a characteristic physiochemical properties, photostability, strong tunable for photoluminescence, etc. For their these special characteristics, they have important applications in the field of solar cells, medical imaging, sensing, detecting, for etc. Some of the methods used for the synthesizing of synthesizing of these quantum dots are microwave irradiation, precipitation methods, soil gel techniques, hydrothermal treatments, etc. These quantum dots can easily be surface modified by hydrogel encapsulation, bioconjugation, or by carboxyl attachment, which helps them to be more biocompatible. So they can also be used in biomedical fields also. Then moving to the materials and methods used. First, the reagents that are used for the synthesizing of the uh, quantum dots are 0.1 molar zinc acetate, 0.1 molar sodium sulfide, manganese sulfate, sodium hydroxide, and MPA, that is mercaptopropionic acid. Here, MPA is the uh, sensor, and manganese uh, and the rest of the other quantum dots. Synthesizes, synthesizes of the undopped quantum dots. For that, about 10 ml of zinc acetate solution was magnetically stirred. To this, 10 ml of sodium sulfide was added by stirring. Then, uh, this uh, the immediately formed colloidal solution was then again magnetically stirred for 30 minutes at a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. Then, for the synthesis of manganese topped MBA cap zinc sulfide, uh, after uh, the magnetic magnetical stirring of the zinc acetate, we add manganese sulfate to it. Uh, then uh, drop wise, then we add sodium sulfide solution with constant stirring. And at last, we add 1 ml of MBA to it, uh, and it's stirred for 15 minutes. For the sensing of glucose, 3 ml of this uh, form, uh, the uh, quantum dots are taken in a cuvette, and varying amount of glucose is added, and then it is excited at a wavelength of 325 nanometer. Here, the scheme here, scheme 1, depicts the illustration. Uh, for the turn of detection of glucose here, 
when we uh, radiate with the 325 nanometer wave wavelength uh, here we can see uh, 590 nanometer is emitted here and with the addition of mb also we get that 590 nanometer but when we add glucose to it we did not get this 590 nanometer here the, actually this 590 corresponds to the peak of the manganese ion now moving to the result and discussion first by doing the optical characterization of uh, these quantum dots which is capped with mba and not capped with mba we can see three major bands are formed the uh, the, uh, the two bands that are around 410 and 470 correspond to the uh, band of the uh, quantum dots that is zinc sulfide and the band near 590 correspond to the manganese ion that is for uh, the band near 410 correspond to the donor sulfur vacancy and valence band second band around 470 is due to the zinc vacancy and third it's due to the manganese ion and uh, while consider these two spectra we can see the mpa capped quantum dots uh, here we can see a increased intensity here this increased intensity is due to the additional energy transfer of mba to manganese ion and as, as well as by the reducing the energy transfer loss due to the non radiative transition now by doing the morphological characterization from the, this stem image we get that the average size of the uh, formed quantum dots is 1.55 nanometer and the sad ring pattern reveals its amorphous nature now for the detection of glucose 3 ml of MBA capped quantum dots are dispersed in a quid and a varying amount of glucose is added. It is a peak that is obtained. The solution were mixed and then shaked for 3 seconds and the uh, corresponding spectra at the excitation wavelength of 325 nanometer is taken. The stock solution for the glucose was 0.1 molar and uh, it is diluted to varying amount, varying concentration and by the gradual addition of glucose we can see the decrease in the intensity of the peaks especially around 590 nanometer so then we can see the mechanism of the quenching the while the addition while the addition of glucose we can see here the decrease in the intensity of the peak so this is due to the quenching of luminescence by the nanoparticles uh, due to the interaction between the sensor and the analyte glucose and from the TEM image obtained after uh, addition of the glucose, we can see there is an aggregate formation. So it's also due to the aggregation that we can say the diminishing in the intensity is obtained. For development of paper strip for the detection of glucose, we take a Wattman fil number 40 filter papers and cut into uh, small pieces and it's soaked in 10 ml of the uh, formed quantum dots and it's dried. And the paper coated strips before and after treatment of glucose was placed under UV illumination. Here we can see the paper strip shows only a slight color change in a visible light, but the irradiation of UV light shows an orange color. Actually, here we can see an orange color under UV light. When the glucose is added, we actually cannot see that orange light. That means the orange light is quenched due to the presence of this glucose. So, as a conclusion, we can say we have successfully MPA camped manganese topped zinc sulfide quantidotes are synthesized by chemical precipitation method. The synthesized quantidotes were optically characterized by PL and morphological characterization by TEM image. And the developed quantum sensor was effectively utilized for the detection of glucose. The photoluminescence intensity of MPA capped manganese top zinc sulfide quantum dots decreases by the gradual addition of glucose ranging from 0 micro, micromolar to 52 micromolar. The quenching of luminescence is due to the interaction between the quantum dots and the glucose and also due to the aggregation of quantum dots upon the addition of glucose and paper strip assay was successfully conducted. It's all about my topic. Thank you. Thank you, Grishma, for your presentation. The session is now open for discussion. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? <laughs> so there are no more questions. So we shall move on to the next speaker. Once again, thank you, Grishma, for your presentation. Thank you. So the next speaker is uh, Jayashree. 
from the Department of Applied Science, University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, Dehradun, Uttarakhand. Jayshri, are you there? Jayshri. You can see Jayshri Sharma. Jayshri, are you there? So we can we can't hear you. Can you please unmute and speak? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible now? Yes, you are audible. Uh, you can present now. Ma'am, the screen is visible. I think it's loading. Please select two slides. Yeah, open it. Open your presentation. Yeah, fine. This time? Yeah, it's okay. This time. Okay, so uh, a very good evening to all. And I say in 2022, first and foremost, thank you for letting me present my work here. So my topic is role of various factors in single point diamond turning machining to manufacture super hydrophobic surfaces. These are the outlines that I will cover for my presentation. So uh, moving uh, forward to the next slide, uh, which includes the basics for my research work, that is super hydrophobic surfaces. So uh, here is the very first question that uh, what are these surfaces? So the surfaces which repels water molecules are said to be the super hydrophobic surfaces. Basically, these are called as the self cleaning surfaces and idea of super hydrophobicity came up from the lotus leaf. Researchers found that the lotus leaf uh, incorporates the dual scale roughness, that is the micro and nano level roughness. So uh, now let us discuss the important factors for attaining super hydrophobicity. So the very first factor, which is essential for super hydrophobic uh, surfaces is low energy surface materials. And the another one is the micro and nano level roughness to the surface. So if these two factors can sustain, then only the surface can be termed as the super hydrophobic one. Now, uh, you all can see here that the water contact angle should be greater than 150 degree in case of super hydrophobic surfaces in the schematic diagram. So uh, these uh, water contact angle tells us about the wetting behavior of the surfaces. Like on the super hydrophobic surfaces, water droplets become spherical in the shape and because due to the intermolecular interactions, the cohesive forces between the liquid molecules are stronger than those of the solid and liquid molecules. Water doesn't spread onto the surface of the substrate and so in in the result water droplets become spherical in the shape and roll ups down the taking all the dirt away from the surface so uh, these are uh, the targeting uh, applications which i am targeting for my research work so uh, i am uh, working on the application of the solar cell uh, i mean uh, the self cleaning application for the solar panels so there are uh, some important factors that are concerned with this application so the very first is soiling generally pv modules are being covered with the glass uh, of approximate thickness 3.3 uh, uh, mm soiling refers to the accumulation of the dust dirt and snow on the pv panels due to which power conversion efficiency of the solar panel decreases by 40 to 60 percent every year which leads to great energy losses so uh, the solution for this is to cover the pv panels with the self-cleaning coatings or the self-cleaning surfaces uh, that uh, for uh, from which the optical uh, transparency will uh, uh, will increase and as a result uh, there will be a great uh, power conversion efficiency and the second problem is the reflection due to reflection of the incident solar radiations onto the PV panels, the power conversion efficiency decreases. Uh, also, if the thickness of the glass is minimum, then these losses couldn't happen. But if the thickness of the glass is maximum, then the, these can sustain uh, in the outdoor conditions. 
therefore the reflection of the light can decrease the power conversion efficiencies so uh, the anti reflective coatings are must for uh, this the third one is the non durability of the super hydrophobic coatings which can restrict their usage in the real world applications so here is the experimental setup so i uh, fabricated uh, the 2d to uh, uh, 2D hierarchical structures onto the surface of the aluminium by using single point diamond turning machine. So here you all can see that first the aluminium work piece. We have diamond turned it because to in in order to remove all the wedge, uh, so that uh, the 2D hierarchical structures can be fabricated uh, very clearly. Also, uh, super hydrophobic coatings are well known in the society and uh, in the different industries due to their self-cleaning characteristics. These coatings are used in the multiple sectors, including marines, automotives, optical devices, textiles, etc. But uh, those super hydrophobic uh, surfaces have attracted a lot of attention for their wonderful uses, but practical applications for the super hydrophobic surfaces in the optical industries are restricted because achieving super hydrophobicity and the transparency at the same time is a technical challenge. So for this difficulty to be overcome, one of the most promising techniques available today is single point diamond turning machining, which can produce hierarchical man micro nano structures with the surfaces that are extremely smooth and have roughness contained within a few nanometers so these are the results these are the some uh, surface morphologies uh, for the uh, 2d hierarchical uh, pattern which i have fabricated by using this machining so here you all can see that and the graph is the 2d extraction graph that is obtained from the cci these are the 3D uh, profile extractions uh, which uh, which are obtained by the CCI and here uh, in the second image, uh, the green surface, there, there are uh, um, some voids or micro cracks are being shown on this, this, this surface. This is due to the chip formation. After that, I have calculated the water contact angle for this and uh, the maximum water contact angle uh, obtained is the 123.7 degrees. Uh, why? Because I have uh, only fabricated these uh, hierarchical structures by using one step uh, machining. That is, uh, this is only the single uh, surface, single surface roughness machining. So now coming to the summary part, so uh, it, is it is possible to create both roughness and transparency using this single, time, single point diamond turning machine. And the two stage machining is very essential for achieving dual scale roughness uh, in order to uh, obtain the water contact angle greater than 150 degree. The average surface roughness achieved here is uh, the 26 nanometers and very few cavities or other structural disturbances are being recorded and through this machining super hydrophobicity can be applied to the optical applications thank you so much thank you jayashree the session is now open for discussion Is there any queries from the audience? So I think there are no, no questions from the audience. So we shall move on to the last participant. So this now we are moving on to the SIL coatings. So next participant is Ashish Sanjay Kurane. Are you there, Ashish? Ashish, are you there? Ashish Sanjay Kurane. I think he has not joined. So we have come to the end of these short and video lectures. I request all the participants to join Hall 1. I request all the participants to join Hall 1. And thank you all for your active participation.
Hello, Manoj sir. Hello, sir, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, Actually, sir, uh, the session in this hall two is over. Uh, can yeah. you please join in hall one? Yeah, I was in hall one since you called me, so I just switched to hall two now again. Oh, so oh, okay, sir. So, uh, so my leave. session, leave. Sir, I was supposed to be in uh, this session, Hall 2, from 8, 1840. So, should yeah, we yeah. join 1840 but, exactly? But uh, the, the schedule uh, has already completed because uh, um, uh, due to some cancellations of okay. participants. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. So, you can this, join. This join Hall 2 is now, now null and void for the time. Yeah, yeah. You can okay. join. Hold on, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir.